People love the letter of James. As I've spoken to different, uh, different groups of people about the letter over the last few weeks, I haven't met anyone yet who doesn't like James. Our people have told me how much they enjoy the memorable imagery and how helpful and practical it, it is uh, for James to focus on actions and behavior rather than in-depth teaching. Uh, if the letter of James was a breakfast cereal, I imagine you'd find it next to the Cocoa Pops and the Fruit Loops rather than down the all-brand Wheat Bix end of the aisle. It's full of bite-sized chunks that you, you don't have to think too much about. Uh, you don't have to chew over as much. And it's easy to see then why it's so popular, why so many people know verses, verses from the letter of James. But while we enjoy dipping into James for a memorable verse, it's not often that we read through or study it as a whole. And I'm not sure why that is but I wonder whether it's because James is, is actually such a challenge to us as believers. As much as James focuses on actions and behaviour, he also has lots to say about our hearts. James asks searching questions about the absolute driving force of our life, whether our hearts are truly set on God, truly captured by him, truly motivated by love for him, or whether our hearts are set on the world. Uh, whether we're fixed on its fallen desires, its confused loves, its compromised motivations. We'll begin our time in the letter of James over the next three weeks, and then we're going to come back to it in small doses during the rest of the year. And my hope and prayer for our time in James is that God will use it to encourage us and refresh us, especially as we come to familiar passages that we know and love. But even more than that, I hope that God will be at work in our hearts, growing us in our wholehearted love for him that changes every part of our life in this world. Now, since we're starting our time in this book, it's good for us to understand a bit about what we're reading. And we're told a lot just in the very first verse that was read for us. Uh, let's look at it again. James chapter 1, verse 1, which says, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. This first verse of James it tells us that this is a letter from James, uh, the son of Joseph and Mary, the biological half-brother of Jesus. Even though the writer of this letter doesn't tell us that explicitly, we're helped by other New Testament writing uh, as part of Jesus' biological family, James isn't prominent in the gospel accounts. What we do see is that like Jesus' disciples, Jesus' family, including James, were confused about him. There were times when they intervened in Jesus' ministry out of concern for Jesus' well-being, trying to protect him from the crowds. Uh, we read this in Mark chapter 3, verse 20, which says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. But then at the start of Acts, after Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension, we find that things have changed for Jesus' family, including James. Straight after Jesus' is his ascension, his return to his father, uh, the 11 remaining disciples returned to the upper room in Jerusalem and James was with them. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we read this. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, including James. And this is the same family who tried to rescue Jesus from the crowds who thought he'd gone mad. But here they are, alongside the disciples, prayerfully and obediently waiting for the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus had promised to send. Their understanding of Jesus had changed. Their relationship with Jesus had changed. James's transformation in particular is explained further as he appears in the list of those who saw the risen Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15. And the resurrection is the reason for James' transformation. See, he grew up with Jesus as a brother, but now he had seen this same Jesus 
risen from the dead. And this transformation is so profound that when the Apostle Paul writes about his visit to Jerusalem later, he meets James, who is now the leader of the church in Jerusalem, someone who's mentioned alongside Jesus' other disciples, the apostles. Uh, Paul writes this in Galatians chapter 1. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. It's this James, the brother of Jesus, whose doubts and confusion were transformed by seeing the risen Jesus from the dead, who then joined with the apostles after Jesus' ascension and who eventually led the early church in Jerusalem. And so this is James, our writer, writing this letter that we get to read and hear from. And immediately at the start of James's letter, we see that the truth about Jesus has changed how James sees himself. James describes himself not in terms of his biological relationship to Jesus, but in terms of his spiritual relationships. He writes as the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, for James, Jesus isn't just a man born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, Nazareth, who taught in Galilee before dying tragically outside Jerusalem. No, Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ, the deliverer and king promised by God and expected by Jews in the last days. The one who Peter proclaimed the truth about to the Jews in his Pentecost sermon in Acts, saying, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah or Christ. And in his introduction, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, also tells us who he's writing to. He's writing to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And this is a phrase and an audience that's loaded with meaning and significance. The 12 tribes is a way of referring to Israel, those who could trace their ancestry back to the 12 sons of Jacob. But because of Israel's disobedience and God's judgment on them, the 12 tribes had been defeated and exiled and scattered among the nations hundreds of years before James was writing. But the Jews in New Testament times were also scattered from Jerusalem. And the book of Acts tells us that after Stephen was martyred, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the region to the nearby areas of Judea and Samaria. And Acts tells us that these scattered believers didn't give up their beliefs about Jesus. Instead, they preached that he was the long-awaited Messiah, and they did this wherever they went. So it's these people, these scattered Jewish believers in Jesus, that James is writing to. As we make our way through the letter, you might notice how much James cares for them. He writes to them like a preacher, with a lot to say in a limited time. Uh, in these first 18 verses that we heard read, we won't look at all of them today, but James has something to say about five separate themes or topics, and it could easily be five separate sermons. In terms of the whole letter, the, this, this first chapter acts like a contents page as James introduces us to the topics that he's going to pick up and expand on at different points in his letter. So don't worry, I won't preach five sermons to us today. We'll dip into the first two of these topics briefly today, uh, knowing that we'll spend more time in them and the other topics as we wake, work our way through the letter. And so James, after introducing himself, telling us about his audience, greeting, he begins with this instruction. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. This is an incredible way for James to begin his letter. Uh, by beginning his letter in this way, he shows us something of the experience of the believers he's writing to. Firstly, they're his brothers and sisters in Christ. And he writes to them knowing something of their situation, knowing what they are facing and what they will face as brothers and sisters in Christ and as a community of believers this side of heaven. 
they will face trials, trials of many kinds. And they are invited along with us to share James's perspective on trials, which is also Jesus' perspective on trials. In the letter, we hear about some of these trials. Poverty and persecution are mentioned as part of the experience of life for some of these believers. Those trials are to be expected for believers who'd fled Jerusalem and are starting a new life among Gentiles in the surrounding regions. But James sets trials up as an intentionally large category of experience because believers face trials of many kinds. Some trials are unique to believers because we're followers of Jesus. Some trials we have in common with those who don't follow Jesus. Uh, Some are temporary, some are lifelong, some are faced by individuals, some by families, some by churches, some are physical, spiritual, emotional, mental. It's possible too that believers might not be facing any noticeable trials right now, but the whenever suggests that they will. Trials of many kinds are the normal experience for believers in this fallen world. And no matter what trials believers are facing or will face, James's encouragement to them, his word from the Lord for them is the same. Consider it pure joy. Now, in case you're wondering, yes, this perspective on trials is meant to shock us to surprise us, to stop us in our tracks. Surely James doesn't mean that. Or he wouldn't mean that if he knew my situation. How could anyone consider it pure joy when they're going through what I'm going through? Well, James tells us the answer. This is how in verse 3 and 4 he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. What James shares with us here is it's incredibly important. It's that no matter what trials believers face, there is a spiritual dimension to them. There is a spiritual purpose for them. Because James tells us that in trials, something is made clear about our hearts, about the object of our faith as our faith is tested. Now, I'm the most test-averse person you could imagine. Over the past term, people from across our church have been doing a Bible course on Sunday afternoons, and they had the chance to say up front whether they wanted to do an exam at the end of it. If I was given that choice, I would say, no way. Because usually if there is a test, then there's a chance of failure. And I have failed so many times, so many tests. So if there's a test, count me out. But here, as believers face trials, something incredible happens. They persevere in their faith in God. They persevere in their confidence in Christ. There's no sense from James that this is a test that could be failed. Because for believers, trials have a different purpose, a positive purpose. Trials draw believers to see the God that they've trusted in to see that he is trustworthy and to see that their trust in him is real and living. It's through trials that these things become clear. And so James is calling believers to see trials as spiritual exercise, the building up of spiritual muscles. The ultimate goal of trials is that they lead us towards completeness, towards spiritual maturity. And it's this knowledge about trials that can lead us to respond to James's command, to consider it pure joy. Not because trials are easy, they're not, but because believers facing trials will come to know things about their God and about themselves that they wouldn't know any other way. And this knowledge about God and about ourselves helps us to persevere to keep going and keep growing as Christians. So this perspective on trials changes us because we ta- if we take this on board, then when we face the trials of many kinds that James is talking about, we won't only ask the normal question that all every human, whether believer or not, asks when facing trials. Why is this happening to me? 
and our response to God won't be what mine can be at times. When I'm faced with trials, I find it so easy to pray things like, Heavenly Father, please fix this now. Please take this trial away. Please make my life comfortable again. As believers, we won't stop there in our questions or in our prayers. Because of what James reminds us here, we might pray, Heavenly Father, even though this trial is hard, I trust you in it. Work through this to deepen my trust in you. Work through this to encourage my confidence in Christ. Work through this to lead me towards perseverance and spiritual maturity. There is such a joy to knowing that trials aren't random. They aren't pointless. It's not that everything is out of control. It's not that I'm a victim. I'm a dearly loved child of a generous God, a God who is so generous that out of loving concern for me, He has told me what he's doing so that as I face trials, he is training me. And through this lifelong training, he's making me mature and complete, lacking nothing. This is what God is doing. This is how trials can be seen as a joy. But then straight away, James shows us that we aren't yet mature and complete. It's likely that there's at least one thing we lack as believers. And that is wisdom, a wisdom to see things the way that God does. And possibly in the context, the wisdom to consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds. But in this lack of wisdom, God is generous to us. Now look with me at verse 5. James' next command is this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God doesn't hold on to wisdom, stingily letting some of it slip out after a trial's passed. He doesn't use wisdom to teach us a lesson about how we should have handled things. No, this verse assures us that God gives wisdom freely and generously to all who ask. Like much of what we read in James, this isn't a new idea about God or about wisdom or about how to get wisdom. See, James is saturated in the teaching of the Old Testament and also in the words of Jesus. And here, James echoes what we read in Proverbs 2, which which says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Now, seeing our lack of wisdom to deal with life in this fallen world, our God is generous. He gives us the wisdom of his word. And as believers in Christ, God has given us his spirit to help us live his wisdom out. The generosity of God in giving wisdom, helping us to see things his way, to live well in his world, is good news. It's good news for us all the time. But it's especially good for those of us who are facing trials. When we think to ourselves, I really don't know what to do here. I don't know where to turn. I don't know what course of action to take. I can't see how God could possibly work through the struggles I'm facing. When we face trials like this, our generous God invites us to come to him, invites you and me to remember who we are, that I am a dearly loved child of a generous God. A God who is so generous that out of loving concern for me, he invites me to come to him and to ask him for wisdom so that he can give it to me freely. Then James warns us that there is a way to go about this asking. There's an attitude to be seen in the asker, in the believer who approaches God in prayer at any time for any reason. Just as God is wholehearted in his generosity to us and open-handed in his generosity to us, those who ask him must be wholehearted in their dependence, in their expectancy towards God. They're trusting God to give everything they need, including the wisdom to face trials. So James explains it in this first picture of the letter that we find in verse 6. It says, but when you ask... You must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. 
James knows what can happen at times when we're facing a trial. After asking, why is this happening to me? Uh, Sometimes I, I might try to solve the trial my own way. I'll try to make my own sense of it with my own resources, with my own understanding, with my own wisdom or the wisdom of the world around me. And then when I can't make sense of it, I'll go to God with my prayers and requests, seeking some of his wisdom. Now, when believers consistently tackle trials like this, when we regularly approach God like this, it shows something about us and about the attitude of our hearts towards God. James shows us that in our doubts, we are like a wave, a wave out in the swell, not not crashing on the beach. Um, James probably had in mind the Sea of Galilee or the Mediterranean. Uh, Maybe a picture for us would be the waves between the heads on the way to Manly. The waves that James shows us are, are, are waves that are indecisive and helpless, sometimes surging this way, sometimes that way, always changing, unpredictable, unstable. Waves being blown around, carried along by the the whims and whirls of the wind. Waves with no anchor, no stability or security or direction. That's what James says we are like. Unless we consistently come to God in prayer, asking God for wisdom because we trust him wholeheartedly. Now the alternative is, is to be wavering, is to be inconsistent is to be temporarily trusting in what works in the moment and then letting it go. It's searching for a solution for the situation you're facing now, but then once that passes, you move on. James tells us that when this attitude is expressed by believers, it's actually the opposite of belief. It's doubt. If this attitude of doubt becomes a consistent pattern, James has a further warning for us in verse 7. That person, he says, the one who doubts, should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. I hope we realise how serious this is. When we doubt God by treating him as one option among many, or when we come to him only when our own resources fail, or when the wisdom of the world doesn't work, When we fail to treat God as the generous God that he is, who loves to hear our prayers, who loves to give wisdom to his people, James says that that person is double-minded. This word double-minded is incredibly important in the letter of James. It picks up on the Old Testament commandment reaffirmed by Jesus as the first and greatest. You might remember how it goes. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. And while loving God with all of anything was an unattainable standard in the Old Testament, the gospel hope of believers is that this command has been fulfilled perfectly in Jesus. And through God's generosity to us in Jesus, we are set free and empowered by the Spirit to follow Jesus in living this way, in loving God this way. Now, it doesn't mean that Christians never have doubts or question anything about what God is doing. But this devotion and trust, this love towards God, becomes a pattern of life. It's seen as a trajectory towards wholehearted love for God through all of life. But the warning of James isn't just to to non-Christians. It's to believers like us. It makes us ask what our behaviour tells us. Do we show by our consistent behaviour and by our prayers that we really are divided? Are we in two minds about who we will trust? Are we in two minds about who we have confidence in? Are we in two minds about where wisdom is found, whether from God or elsewhere? Are we in two minds because we love God, but part of us also loves the world, longs for what it can offer us? The message of James is that a believer cannot live like that, cannot pray like that. This is when our thinking about trials comes full circle because this is where the challenge lies. I know some of the trials being faced by people in our church family. They are not small challenges. And I'm certain that there are countless more being faced by people that I know nothing about 
when we're facing trials, when we're facing the difficulties of life, how easy is it for us to be double-minded, to be unstable, to be unsettled in our faith? But alongside this challenge, we've also been shown the God who has shown us his immense generosity. And we've seen the incredible wisdom he makes available freely to those who ask in faith. And so as believers who have seen the generosity of our God, how can we fail to love him? How can we fail to be single-minded in our devotion to him? How can we fail to hear James's warnings and respond to them by returning to God wholeheartedly? When trials surface next for each of us, my hope and prayer is that we will remember the encouragement that we've heard today. And we will single-mindedly and wholeheartedly run to our generous God, seeking and finding his wisdom in the midst of our struggles, whatever they might be. For now, let me lead us in prayer. Lord God, we rejoice in your greatness and power, your patience and love, your generosity and grace. Our Father, in whatever trials we're facing or will face, please enable us to turn to you and trust in you, persevering in faith through the wisdom you give us. Our Father, enable us by your Spirit to honour you in our thoughts, words and actions and to serve you in every aspect of our lives as you grow us towards maturity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.